This morning we're in a late model JK with an LT1 and an 8 speed. This Jeep pretty much has it all. We got the Atlas transfer case, we got double throw down suspension, aftermarket radio, all sorts of electronics, we got the electric rock rails, um, roll cage, uh, I'm guessing that's an S pod. We got the works in this thing, we got a ton of stuff. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about the drive lines, axles, and suspension because I'm getting a lot of calls on that. But before I do, I just want to say that the engine conversion market right now is a hard market. You guys in insurance know what I'm talking about. Uh, getting parts has become difficult. The prices and everything is increasing. Not just finished goods like engines, but parts for fabrication like steel and tubing for exhaust systems. Everything has just gone up and up and up. Really, the only defense we have against this is taking more time trying to source parts. And I know customers get impatient, but it is what it is. The supply chain is screwed up, and it's going to be screwed up for a little while, so you got to be patient. Normally, the way we work is you put a deposit down, and then we call you when your time is up. And a lot of times, we'll tell you, hey, it's you're two months out. But then two months out, GM is out of engines. So that's just the reality we have to deal with. Now, I've noticed that some other shops are six months out, eight months out, a year out. I know that axles and pretty much everything on the supply chain of these Jeeps is just out. So if you want to get a conversion done, be willing to wait. But the good news is we're not going to ask you to bring your Jeep in and leave it non-operational for four months. You drive your Jeep until you send it out to Vegas and hopefully GM will start stepping up on parts supply. They're starting to trickle through the 10 speeds and the LT1s uh, better than they were. They did redesign the LT1. Well, I'm not going to say they redesigned it. They updated it with some new cam phasers, and we're starting to see those come into production now. All right, so let's talk about axles and suspension. A lot of guys say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm getting an LS 6.0. Do I need to go to Dana 60s or a Dana 80? Uh, what drive shafts should I run? And I'll tell you my advice. The Jeep we're driving has Evo double throwdown and killer axles, and you don't need that for an everyday driver. JK with a V8. In fact, we've got plenty of LSs and LTs running around on stock suspension. Um, I do recommend that you upgrade the drive shafts for a couple of reasons. One, the R Zeppas aren't the strongest shaft out there. I, I know they're pretty strong, but not, in an LT1, you're probably going to end up twisting it. But the lengths usually are not perfect. We move the transfer case back about an inch or an inch and a half in most of these conversions. Uh, if you lift your Jeep up, it tends to pull the axles inward. So it's just best to upgrade the shafts in my opinion. Adams Driveline does a great job on shafts. They use all American parts, Spicer parts, and we have never had a problem with them. The rear shaft, we recommend a 1350 on the average build. That would be most LTs and LSs. That would be a front CV 1350 and a rear 1350 joint. Get rid of that cone yoke that Jeep runs because those, those put a lot of extra leverage on the pinion. In the front, we run a 1350 lower joint, but we run a 1310 upper CV. And the reason is clearance to the transmission. Now this isn't just a LS thing, this is a Hemi thing, this is a, a V6 thing. When you stuff the axle all the way up, the track bar forces the axle over to the passenger side. And that can drive the CV into the transmission pan. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen JKs with ripped boots up there because of that exact reason. When you start getting high flex suspension where you get a lot of travel and, it's, and it pushes it over more than stock, then you can run into that. So by running the 1310 CV, we can usually gain as much clearance as we need for most suspension systems. So my advice is go ahead and update the axle. If you're running an LT4 or some 500 horsepower plus monster engine, you might want to run a 1410 rear, especially if you get traction. And this is really important. When guys say, hey, do I need to upgrade my axle? Do I need to upgrade this? Do I need to upgrade that? But what it comes down to is one, how do you drive? If you drive like a maniac, you're gonna break stuff. It just doesn't matter what you put in your, I, I, I had a guy break a Dana 80 with a supercharged LS. So you're gonna break stuff. What really matters is if you hook up. Because if you've got an LT1 with 33 inch tires and you floor it, those tires, they're not gonna hook up enough to damage the drivetrain. But if you've got an LT1 on sticky Nittos 37s or 40s and that thing hooks up, then you can start breaking parts. But a lot of it comes down to the skinny pedal. How do you drive? If you drive like a maniac, 
you're probably going to break parts. If you drive normal, these are my recommendations. Traction also comes in a different way. Let's say you're off-road. In fact, I had a guy do this in Moab. You're off-road. He had all terrains on his Jeep, 35s or 37s. And he dropped his front tire down into a wedge between a couple of rocks. And he had an LS3, which has got a lot of power. And instead of easing it out of the situation, he basically got into the throttle. And that tire wedged in and hooked up and ended up breaking the seat right off the axle. So if you drive normal, you're probably not gonna have issues like that. Learn how to feather the throttle. Because especially with these LTs now, you've got a lot of torque on the bottom end. Right off idle, these LTs have enough power to break stuff. Now you're gonna notice that if you have one of our conversions, that we keep most of the torque management active. And I did a video on that recently. Torque management protects your parts. Uh, we removed all the torque management in a 5.3 LS, I'm sorry, LT, a while back, and we broke parts. We broke the ARB locker, we broke broken drive shafts. So what GM does is they limit the output of the engine to save your parts. And it's not just launching. Uh, every shift torque management is involved with. You know these transmissions are torque management based. So there's anti-clunk so that you have a smooth shift and you don't feel that clunk like you used to in some of the older transmissions. So the rules are that if you drive normal, you feather the throttle when you get into a situation. Yeah, you get on it every once in a while. These are my recommendations. The stock Dana 44s in a Rubicon and the 4430 in a non-Rubicon are plenty strong for most conversions with 35 inch or under tires. Now having that front 44 with a locker is always nice uh, one of the biggest Achilles heels with the front axle I find in all these JKs is they bend. And that really has nothing to do with the engine. It's just you guys hit a curb or hit a bump too hard. That's probably more of a concern than actually breaking the parts. So the stock axles work just fine in the LS 5.3 and the 6.0 and even the 6.2. I've got 80,000, no, I gotta go up, I gotta think. I've got 100,000 miles now in my JK, about 98,000, 99,000. And it's an 09 Rubicon, stock 44 axles, never been modified, 6.2 L9H, and it's perfect. I've had zero issues with my axles. That vehicle was driven back in 2010 and 11 by the press, and they did a lot of burnouts in it using the 35-inch tires. They were the BF Goodrich mud terrains. And those axles are still quiet. And one of the things you can notice is if an axle's not set up right or if it's starting to wear out, is you have acceleration and deceleration on the gears. And you might notice one way, like accelerating, it's very quiet. But under deceleration, you'll hear a whine. So your ring and pinion might be starting to wear. Uh, other times you'll notice it at certain loads at cruise. And that could be an indication that your differential's wearing out. Now some of the bigger differentials just make noise anyway. Like you guys could probably hear a little bit of whine right now, but I got one tons and an Atlas. Uh, it's not bad, it doesn't bother me at all, but it's definitely a little bit more noisy than stock. So if you notice your differential starting to make noise, take it in and have a look at it. If you want to go out and drive like a gorilla, then upgrade your axles. So the question I get often is, can I go with the Ultimate 44, the D44? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to just get a front Rubicon 44 axle, we do them all the time. Guy comes in with a Sport or a Sahara, and he wants a front 44 with a locker. We get them right from Mopar, and it's a good deal. Now, if you're going to drive more aggressively, you're going to hit the trails, you're going to do waterfalls and all that crap, then definitely go to 60s. Especially, you got an LT1, you got 40s. 37 inch and bigger tires, in my opinion, put a lot more load on the powertrain. And the tires also hook up more. They're usually wider, they have a bigger footprint, they have a better contact patch to the ground. So now we're starting to hook up. And once we hook up, and now we have the power of a V8, especially the LTs, because the LTs, are like electric motors, they can put out instant torque. Then we gotta start being concerned about the axle. So I'd probably upgrade to a 60. And which 60? I don't care. Take your pick. You know, they're all pretty good. The, the Dana 60s are good. We really like the Dynatrax. Some guys like Curry, G2, whatever you want. Now, as far as the options on those axles go, it's like buying a car. Do you want RCVs? Do you want an e-locker? Do you want an air locker? Uh, do you want a skid plate for the hydraulic steering? I mean, there's just so many crazy things that you can get with these axles. What I would recommend is calling the manufacturer and talking with them about it. And that brings me to my next point, and that is 
Custom axles are custom axles. If you call Steve Maroney, who's a really good guy over at Dynatrack, hey, I want a Dana 60. He's going to say, well, do you want a pro float or a semi float? Do you want RCVs? And there's going to be a hundred options. But if you say to him, I'm doing a Motec swap. I don't really don't know what all this stuff means. Can you set it up for me? And he'll set it up. He'll choose the most popular options for your situation. Steve pretty much knows the gearing that we run. But if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't, just give us a call and we'll tell you. And I've said this over the last 10 years many times. With 35s, we recommend 410s. With 37s, we recommend 456. With 40s, 513s. Now that's the average gear, the general gear, the center gear for on and off-road. If you're gonna off-road more than on-road, you trailer it to the trail, go up a size. You're towing up in Colorado at high altitude, go up a size. So go from that 513 to the 538 on the 40. On the flip side, if you never go off-road, we got plenty of guys running 37s with 373s, especially with the LTs, and it's awesome. You get better gas mileage, it's quieter. So what's average is what I just stated. But you can go up or down a size based on your need, how heavy is your JK, etc. Now, if you get a custom axle from, and I'm just going to pick Dynatrack out because we've been doing a lot of Dynatracks lately, but it's not like we don't do others. There's Fusion, there's Curry, there's Dana, there's a lot of other ones out there. But we've been doing some two doors lately. And you get a two door with a 20 inch drive shaft and a four or five inch lift, and you got a really high pinion angle. So there's a couple of things you can do. One, try to go to a high pinion axle. And I know some guys say that's weaker, but at the same time, it helps set the, uh, the drive shaft angle, and that's kind of a compromise. But you might have to roll that axle up. If you get a five inch lift on a two door, there's a possibility you're gonna get some driveline vibration. So you wanna roll the axle up. And most of the pre-built axles, like if you were just to go get a Dana 60 or a, a U44 from your Mopar dealer, they're gonna be fixed. Those brackets are welded on. The spring perches, the sway bar mounts, they're welded on, you really can't change it. And there's something called a separation angle. And the separation angle is basically the angle between the pinion and what is flat, meaning the spring perches. So what ends up happening is you buy a four-door axle, because most of these axles are designed for four-door JKs with three-inch lifts, because they know that's the average build. But now you're the strange guy with a two-door and a five-inch lift and you roll that pinion up so that the drive shaft angle is like two degrees at the pinion and you can go plus or minus, try both ways, see what you get better results with, but you roll that axle up and now what ends up happening is the springs are aiming backwards and the sway bar mounts don't line up. So what a company like Dynatrack will do is they'll tack the brackets on. So you install it in the vehicle, cut the tack welds, roll it where you want it, get it exactly where you want it with the body on, weight on the vehicle, and then you weld it. That way you know it's perfect. You're not gonna get that with a production-made axle. Some manufacturers will say, what separation angle do you want? And if you don't know what you want, then just get it unwelded and weld it up yourself. We've had some two-door builds where the customers bought the axle and sent them to us, and we get them in the vehicle, and by the time we roll that pinion up, the springs are an arc. They're like a half circle. They're bent so badly. And then we gotta cut the brackets off and reset them and you know, that's a lot of work. Okay, so the 60s will work in most applications. Uh, I rarely, rarely see 60s fail. The only time I really see 60s fail is when a guy goes out into the sand and he's really hard in it for a long period of time and they get hot. Now, if you start doing some hard launches on asphalt or concrete, you know, where you're chirping the tires every time, that's gonna put a lot of load in that axle. And one of the things that the LT has done is it knows when you're moving. If you try to power brake an LT, you're not gonna get the results you think. Remember in the old days we used to power brake, that's where you push on the brake. We even had line locks where you could lock the front wheels um, with a button and then release it when you're drag racing. But on an LT, it knows that you're on the throttle and it knows you're not moving and it knows you're on the brake. So it's gonna limit torque. So you can't do that traditional power brake launch. Now launch control today uh, is becoming popular and you know a lot of manufacturers are offering it but it really is a thrash. And I've read magazines where they say you can only do so many of those launches before something gets damaged. So these operating systems try to protect your axles, but they cannot protect you from stupidity. So if you're gonna go out there and you're gonna drive like a maniac, you're gonna break something, pretty much no matter what you got. But don't waste your money. If you got a relatively stock JK, you got 35 inch tires, you don't have armor and winches and bumpers and skid plates, it's relatively light. You got an LS 
6.0 and LS 5.3. Don't waste your money on axles. Don't waste your money on all this high-end driveline stuff. Just keep it stock and drive it normal. You're still going to be able to go everywhere you want off-road just like you did before. You might have to be a little more conservative with a throttle pedal, but that's about it. Now, if you're in the middle, you got the 35 to 37, especially like the 35s, they're 13 and a half inches wide, and they're like bubble gum. You know the ones I'm talking about, the ones you can't barely push the vehicle when it's in neutral. Um, those things hook up, and while they have advantages off-road and in water, etc., cetera, um, that's what damages these driveline components is, is hooking up. So I'd say that you're in the middle ground. Stock 44s might hold up and they might not, but you can always beef up 44s. You can go out to Adams here and he'll gusset them and see them and put in stronger axles. And I will say, uh, the aftermarket axles are a good improvement. The stock axles, uh, while not weak, when you get the bigger tires, I, I've seen them twist and, and break. So uh, you might want to think about going to some aftermarket axles. But you can beef up the 44 to make it stronger. But if you're going to get to that point where you, you throw 37s on, you're going to go out to Fordyce or Rubicon, just get the 60s throw the 60s on there and I know it's a big nut I know it's a lot of money but if you like your Jeep and you're gonna keep it in the long term and you're gonna stay with those larger tires it, it's worth it so you say well I see all these guys with the Dana 80s and these uh, 14 bolts and, and just other really large axles and and they're viable and they have a, a purpose um, the, you got an LT4 you got an LT5 you got a 600 horsepower uh, manual transmission LS3 you're gonna dump the clutch and that's where they come in. Now on those builds, we run 1410 rear drive shafts. And here's something else to consider. The bigger the axle, the stronger the axle, usually the more friction the axle. We all know it's heavier, so the unsprung weight goes up, which means it's probably not gonna ride quite as good. Now on something like this, the double throwdown, um, they ride pretty good. But you put a Dana 80 on stock suspension and you're gonna feel it. So there's going to be more friction. The way the axle is built, it's preloaded and there's bigger components, so expect a little bit less gas mileage, and that's that's all there is to it. You can't get around that. So there's pluses and minuses. You have a strong axle, but you're losing on the economy end, and I know a lot of you just don't care about economy, but when we get the guys with the 43-inch tires and Dana 80s front and rear, and they're complaining they're only getting 12, 13 miles to the gallon, that's why. There's a lot more in the powertrain, the transfer case, we can talk about gear ratios, low gear ratios, which we are going to do, but I'm going to save it for the next video because this video is getting a little drawn out. One of the reasons I'm not going to talk about transfer cases right now is because there's different transfer cases that can work on your application. There's the automatic transfer case, there's an all-wheel drive transfer case, there's the 241J, there's the 241OR, which is the Rubicon transfer case, the off-road, there's uh, the early transfer case for the automatic in the JK. There's the late transfer case for the automatic on the JK, which is the WA580, which has a weird female input shaft. And we'll also talk more in depth about the gear ratio, especially in the transfer case, because you can't gear your vehicle like you used to with the V6. The V6 is so gutless, you pretty much have to gear it toward to the engine. These LSs and LTs have so much power, and remember, two more firing pulses per revolution, so you're putting more inherent torque out that you can't gear them the same as a V6. So we'll talk about that in the next video too. So we're gonna head to the, to the mountain right now and we will see you shortly.